We're going to be talking today about the Reza Revit link. Now, in the advertisement for this webinar, we mentioned that it was sort of a prerequisite or highly recommended that you watch the previous Reza Revit link tutorial or the video that we had done, the webinar. The reason for that is that today we're going to be touching on a number of advanced topics. One of the questions that I frequently get regarding the Reza Revit link is how to deal with the more advanced troubles. Certainly, we've done a number of different presentations in the past, and all those presentations are typically geared towards first-time Revit users. So I wanted to put something out there for those of you who actually have used the link or are just starting to so that you can see some of the more in-depth methods of troubleshooting within the program. So today we're going to be talking about Revit Structure 2011. We're going to be talking about Reza Floor 5.0.1 and Reza 3D 9.0.1. Now, these are the latest versions of all these programs, and we have Revit links also available uh, for Revit Structure 2010 as well. And these are both for the 32 and 64-bit versions. So these will also all work together. But today I'm going to be showing off these latest versions just because they have the latest in capabilities within the link. Now, today we're going to be talking about a number of common issues. To start with, we're going to be talking about wall openings, Beam vertical offsets, one of the biggest things is analytical versus physical models. We have what's called vertical projections and then physical analytical beam ends. Column vertical projections are a huge thing for Reza Floor. Uh, start and end release codes, which many folks don't realize can actually transfer back and forth within the link. We have the concept of X bracing with work points. This is a modeling tip, actually, that's available in the Reza Revit Link user's manual, but I'll be pointing this out sort of live here. We're going to talk about coordinate systems. We're going to talk about a uh, beam versus column versus wall reference level. Reference levels are very important within the program. And then lastly, we're going to be talking about the not for analysis flag, the concept of unconnected walls, the ideas behind 3D-only members, such as H-braces and V-braces, with respect to the Reza floor link. And lastly, we're going to talk about cantilevers with respect to the Reza floor link. So without further ado, I'm going to come in here into Revit Structure 2011. And what I have is this model in here that I have called Bad Framing. And I'm going to load this up. Now, this is a custom model that I've created solely for the purpose of troubleshooting very common problems. I frequently get technical support emails about all of the problems that we're going to be covering today in this model. So I've built this very small model just to illustrate how many things can go wrong with modeling in Revit, and at the same time how easy it is to prevent these sort of mistakes from happening in the link as you're modeling in Revit or transferring back and forth. So to begin with, let's just take a look at this. And this is really almost an excerpt of a larger model, but in this case, this is the full extent of all that we have here. So we have a couple of columns. We've got this wall over here, a few steel wide flange beams with the joist sitting on top of one of them. And then down here, we actually have a grade beam forming these sort of combined footings that we have below. And so just taking a look around, aside from the fact that we have this offset right here between the beam and the wall, there doesn't appear to be anything really wrong with this model at all. Now, this offset could definitely be an intentional thing, such as if we had some sort of corbel or something uh, supporting the beam from the wall that didn't need to be modeled yet, but was going to be handling in some sort of detailed way, or detailing, I should say, way, later on within the model. So the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to export this, and we're going to export it over to Risa 3D. Now, the Risa floor... Revit link is a bit more sophisticated than the Risa 3D Revit link, and so it has additional limitations. But I find that for troubleshooting, when you start running into errors and problems in this such, it's usually best to first try to get it to come over to 3D correctly, and once you can do that, then you can actually move it over to Risa Floor, which in most buildings is ultimately where you're going to want the project. So from within Revit here, I'm going to come up to Add-ins, and I'm going to hit Export to Risa up at the top on that button. Then we're going to come over and export this into Risa 3D. And I'm going to just use all the default settings on here. And we're going to export this out to a new exchange file called badframing.exe in the same folder as this project. And so when I hit OK, it's automatically going to run through here. And here it's firing up Risa 3D for me. And so we've got this launched now, 
And if I take a look at my Risa 3D model, the first thing I note is I get a warning log message, and it says Rev it, member Rev M6 shape changed to RE one by one. Well, in today's webinar, we're going to be going over each one of these warning messages, so let's talk about this rather than just glossing over it. What we have here in this case is this Revit member where the shape was changed. Now, what that means is that the shape that was designated in the Revit model does not or cannot exist on the Risa 3D side, and so as a result, we changed it to what's called an RE one by one which is simply a rectangular one inch by one inch solid bar. And if I go to take a look at my member labels by clicking on this black M, I can take a look and see what Revit M6 is. And Rev M6 is this beam that goes across here. Well, that's that K joist that we had. This is a 14K1. Obviously, that can't exist in Risa 3D because Risa 3D does not support open web joists. So that's one of the first issues that we're going to run into. But let's sort of skip over that for now and just say that we could assign some dummy size to it on the Risa 3D side. Let's take a look at some of the other issues with how this model's transferred over. Well, one thing I noticed right away is that that wall opening that we had on the Revit side didn't appear in Risa 3D. Yet the Risa Revit link is perfectly capable of sending wall openings back and forth. Now, if I come over to the Revit side and I take a look at the wall, and I just sort of hover over the wall and hit tab, the first thing I can instantly tell is wrong is that I do not have an opening modeled in this wall. Now, you'll look at this and say, well, there's an opening right there. Well, that's not an opening in the true sense of a term. An opening within Revit is actually an object that exists as sort of a void that gets placed onto a solid object. Now, in this case, what I've really done is I've created this wall by creating a donut-shaped profile where I've said that there are these lines inside of the wall that define the profile. Now, the Reza Revit link doesn't understand this, and for obvious reasons, because you could certainly create any sort of crazy shape in here using the profile, which is why we've limited the transfer of openings to only those of wall openings. The easiest way to get around this is to come over and set my work plane. So I'm going to want to work off of grid line 2 in this model, which is where the wall exists. And in Revit, I'm going to come up and set that work plane over to grid line 2, so I'm actually working on grid 2 and I'll switch over to an elevation view. Now here I can look at the wall, and one of my drawing options is this one right here. It's called wall opening. This is what we take a look at from the Reason to Revit side. And if I come in here, I can actually draw an opening on this wall, and I'm just going to sort of eyeball it here, but I could certainly adjust the dimensions as necessary if I wanted to, so that now I have this opening, and when I hover over it, it highlights as a separate object. But what I also need to do is I need to come back and edit the profile of that wall to remove that donut shape on the interior. So now I have a solid wall, and as a completely separate element voiding that wall, I have this opening that's on here. So now that these are separate objects, let's take a look at that transfer. I'm going to come back up here to add-ins. I'm going to export to Risa. And because I haven't round-tripped, it's not going to hurt anything to overwrite that previous exchange file. So I'll just hit OK once again, and we're going to come back over into Risa 3D. And so here we can see that opening displayed right on the wall there. So clearly it did transfer in this case. Now let's take a look at the next problem that we can see from the Risa 3D side. Aside from the fact that the joist size didn't come over, we can also note that this joist is actually hovering above the beams on either end. So let's go back into the Revit side and take a look at things. What we can see is that this is an open web steel joist. As you can see, it has been correctly modeled such that the joist is sitting on top of the beam. And certainly for collaboration between a mechanical engineer and an architect, it is very important that we model these correctly such that the joist actually exists where it's going to. But structurally, this is definitely causing some problems within the model. Now let me click on this joist here, and the first thing we're going to see is these numbers printed at the end as well as displayed in the joist properties. These are the start and end level offsets. And you'll see that this model's been created with a two and a half inch offset for the start and end level to account for the fact that this joist is raised up. And this is actually not the preferred method of modeling. If a beam is going to have a uniform raise or drop, say due to the fact that there's joist seats, or maybe due to the fact that the level in Revit is set to a finished floor elevation, whereas you'd actually have, say, a six-inch drop for the top of steel on the beam, you would not want to use these offsets on here. Offsets, instead, are really designed in Revit to be able to account for things like a sloping roof. 
where, say, this end would be zero relative to this end being four if the building was sloping down in that direction. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove those start and end level offsets because I don't really want a slope on this member. So I'm going to give it a zero offset on this side and a zero offset on that side. Now, of course, the inherent problem that we're going to run into is that now the joist is dropped down and it doesn't exist in its correct location. But we can overcome that by choosing what's called a Z-direction offset. So if I come down here, the Z-direction justification is currently set to top, but what I want to do is set that to other. And here I can specify any value, so I'm going to do a two and a half inch offset. And what this means is that analytically, the beam is going to exist exactly lined up with the other beam, but that physically it's going to be lifted. Now what do I mean by analytical versus physical? Let's take a look at the analytical model on the Revit side for a moment. If I flip over to this analytical view, what we'll see is we'll see an orange line on the joist and an orange line on the beam. Those lines represent the analytical portion of the beam. Now note that in Risa 3D, we use this form of stick modeling, where the stick just exists at the center of all the members. Well, in Revit, there's an analytical model that's very similar. This whole beam can really be represented as this one stick. Now in this case, Raising or dropping this member down to be a zero foot offset, but giving it the two and a half inch Z direction offset still doesn't seem to have corrected the problem that as we can clearly see on the Revit side, that analytical line is floating above the girder. So let me just scroll down here on the Revit side, and what we'll see, one of the aspects of the properties of this member is that its vertical projection is set to auto detect. Now the vertical projection is one of the analytical properties of every member within the model, and it controls where the analytical line gets drawn relative to the physical line. The default setting in Revit is always to have things set to auto detect. However, Revit's auto detection mechanism isn't always perfect, and sometimes it chooses some odd locations. So one thing I want to do is change the vertical projection, and instead of auto detect, I can assign it directly to a level, such as roof. And so here, when I assign it to roof, now you'll see that the analytical line exists at the same elevation as the beam, and the physical joist is floating two and a half inches above that, exactly where we want it. So now if I export back over to Risa 3D, it should update accordingly. Now we're back in Risa 3D, same warning regarding the joist, but look at that. Now the joist line is actually lined up in here. Now, just to answer a question that I know is probably going to come up here, uh, you know, is it better to make that correction over here on the Revit side or in the Risa 3D side? There's not really a clear answer on that. I mean, certainly there's advantages to both ways. But my own personal preference is to make as many changes as possible on the Revit side as possible so that I can also get my Revit model in general cleaned up. Not only is it good to have just a clean Revit model overall, but as you start to practice these things of getting your vertical projection set right, getting your analytical lines correct, it means that moving forward as you create new models in Revit, you're less likely to make the same mistakes that are going to have to be cleaned up over and over again. Okay, so we have the joist vertical projection all set. Let's go back over to this Risa model and see one of the other issues that we have. Okay, and so I'm taking a look at the connection between the beam and the wall over here, and we can see that this beam is actually falling short of that wall. We have these two nodes that are separated. And coming back over into the Revit model, when I take a look, the problem is I don't see any issue. That beam appears to go straight to the wall. Now that's the physical Revit model, Taking a look at the analytical Revit model, what I can see is that that beam actually stops short of the wall analytically, even though physically it does go over and connect. And so this is an obstacle that we're going to have to face, and we can actually fix this easiest in plan view. So I'll switch over to the roof plan view, and here we have this beam, and when I click on it, there's a small blue dot that appears at the true end of the beam. And you'll see that that dot ends over here, However, the beam's actually sticking out to here because of these two arrows. These are the extensions of the beam. And this allows you to pull back or extend a beam end physically relative to its analytical end. And that's to account for things like detailing, where maybe you would actually pull the beam back a bit to model out some more advanced steel detailing or a gusset plate, whereas analytically, the beam needs to go all the way to the end. So the first thing that I'll do is I'm going to click and drag 
this beam out to connect it to the wall here. And so when I do that, now that blue dot appears right at the wall. It's sort of automatically snapped to. And when I come over into my model, I can see that it has brought that out, but the beam is now sticking through the wall, and that's a problem. So if I click on this beam, we're going to see as one of its properties, it has this start extension and end extension. And so I'm just going to set both of these to zero so that the physical beam ends right where the analytical one would. And the program is, of course, smart enough due to clash detection to trim it back at least to the face of the wall. So now that one's been corrected. Taking a look over at the other side, we can see that this beam actually analytically is going all the way to the wall even though it's pulled back. This is the polar opposite of what we were just dealing with. So now if I come into my plan view, I can click on this beam and we'll see that that blue dot also doesn't line up with the wall. So I'm going to just click and drag that over to line it up. And then furthermore, because I want this beam to be held back on purpose, I'm going to, going to give it a negative 8 inch start extension and so that's going to pull back the face of that beam eight inches from the face of the wall here. So we can see that the uh, overall model physically doesn't look any different, but yet Reese is going to interpret this very differently now. So let me export again back over into Reese 3D. And so now that we've corrected the analytical models and made any changes to the extensions as necessary, which Reza doesn't pay any attention to the extensions, what we find is that these beams now line up perfectly and attach themselves onto the wall. So we're making good progress at this point. Let's talk perhaps about the columns that we have within the program here. What I can see is that this column doesn't actually come up and touch that beam. Let's go back over to the Revit side and take a look at it. Oops. And here we are in Revit. So physically, the column comes to the underside of the beam analytically, what's happening with that column? Well, let's take a look. That blue line there that represents the analytical line for the column stops short of the analytical lines for the two beams it supports. And it's these stick figure lines that are exactly what's transferring over into Risa 3D. So I'm going to click on this column. And in its column properties within Revit, I'm going to scroll down here and take a look at its top vertical projection. This is the same as the vertical projection that we looked at for the joist. And we'll see that that is set to be top of column. Well, let's try auto detect. And when I choose auto detect, the Revit mechanism is smart enough to recognize that that column does support these beams. So it actually projects the column's analytical line up to the beams at this point. So now if I export this column back out to Risa 3D again, we can see the overall effect on it. And here we go. Now that I've just changed that vertical projection to correct the analytical line, now we're getting a correct export to the Risa 3D side. All right, next we'll go back into the Revit side and take a look at the lower ends of the columns. And what we can see here in Risa is that this down here is my grade beam. Let me just render this for a moment. And these are my steel columns, but I have this gap between them. And I have this boundary condition on here as well. And what Risa 3D automatically does when we transfer over from Revit is it places a boundary condition at the bottom of a column, and it determines that it's the bottom of the column not only by being physically at the bottom, but also at the idea that no other framing comes into it. And this is to prevent us from placing a boundary condition at, say, a column splice somewhere up in the model where the two physical columns are modeled as separate pieces. So let's take a look at the Revit side again here. And we can see on the Revit side that the analytical line does not go all the way down. I'm going to take a look at elevation for just a moment here on this. What we can see is we have this ground floor at elevation 100 feet and this roof at elevation 111. And this column sticks down somewhat below ground floor but before going into the pedestal for these footings on here. So analytically, if I click on this column, let's take a look at what its bottom vertical projection is. And that's set to auto detect. And auto detect clearly is not detecting itself correctly. So let's try setting that to bottom of column. And when we do that, you can see the line projects down all the way to the bottom of the physical column. And I want to do that on both sides. And this is just sort of to point out to you that there is no one sil silver bullet answer for how to correct these issues. For example, on this column, 
the analytical line was previously set to top of column, but that was wrong. Auto detect is what we wanted. And on the bottom of that same column, it was set to bottom of column, whereas auto detect or auto detect was wrong and bottom of column is what we wanted. And so there's no simple answer on these. But once you start to work with the program, you start to learn these, and instinctively by looking at these analytical models, you'll see exactly how things need to be done to export correctly. So now I'm going to export back out again now that I've brought those analytical lines back down. And we'll see that now the columns do come all the way down to meet the grade beam. However, we'll also note that there are no automatic boundary conditions created for these columns now. So if I were to try to solve this model, it would just be considered floating out in space. So it would be wise to put those boundary conditions in here. And the reason they weren't automatically created is because the program is not inherently expecting a grade beam to be there. And so it thinks maybe this is an actual framing beam, and it errors on the side of not putting the boundary conditions in. But they're easy enough to specify on your own as well. So here we have those boundary conditions placed right on there. Now, speaking of that grade beam, when we take a look at it from the Risa 3D side, if I double-click on this member, you'll note that I have these little circles on the end. These are pin symbols. And coming in here, I can see I have some rather odd release codes coming out of there. Full moment release and some different types of individual release codes for the end releases. So this is somewhat similar to a pin-pin condition that's been created. And certainly on a grade beam, I would want to detail that to be fixed-fixed to be able to truly give me the sort of frame action that I need over here to resist things and allow this grade beam to participate in my model. Now, coming back over to Revit, when I click on that grade beam, you'll see one of the properties, as I scroll down over here, is that the start release is created as user-defined and the end release is created as pinned. Well, these start and end releases actually transfer back and forth between Reza and Revit. So if I come in here and tell the program that the start and end releases are fixed to begin with, then when I export over to Reza 3D, it's going to understand that. So now I export and create a new model. And in this new model now, that beam is shown as being fixed on both ends. So now we will actually be able to get true frame action grade beam behavior out of there. Now, you'll also note that the foundations have not come over. And the reason for that is because these haven't been modeled as footings. These have actually been modeled as a foundation slab and as a column, respectively. Now, let's take a look next at bracing and how that transfers back and forth. So I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to put in a single diagonal brace within this model, and I'm going to put it along grid line 1. So what I'm going to do is come up here to set my work plane in Revit. It's very important to set work planes whenever you're drawing vertical elements. And I want to set that to be grid line 1. And so now when I take a look at this from a north elevation, I can come in and draw a brace. And let's create a 6 by 6 by half inch tube brace on this model. Now work points. Work points are very important. In terms of how I would actually want this constructed and detailed in the field, in this particular case, let's say that I want that brace to come together right at the center line of the beam and the center line of the column. This will ensure that when it comes time to design the connection, as well as design the members, there's no eccentricity and no moment, therefore, to design for. And I can actually use the uniform force method out of the AISC in order to detail these gusset plates. And so physically, I want this shown correctly, so I'm going to start up there, and I'm going to come right down to the base of the column. And we get this 6 by 6 by 0 0.5 inch brace shown in here. And let's take a look at this in the physical model, and here's our diagonal brace shown. Next, let's take a look at it in the analytical model. In the analytical model, we'll see something rather interesting. When I bring this up into a relatively elevation view, what we see is that the analytical model and the physical model aren't aligning themselves. Physically, that brace is going right to the center point here. Analytically, it's going up to the top because the program is smart enough to recognize that that analytical line is supposed to actually come up and connect with the analytical lines of the beams. Now, this is a minor discrepancy, and obviously there's a few degrees difference between the physical and the analytical here. And when we export over to Risa, what we're going to find is that the geometry that Risa is going to use 
is going to be slightly different from the geometry that actually physically exists since Reed's is taking the beams as up here versus down a little bit farther. But ultimately, in terms of your structural analysis, this shouldn't make a huge amount of difference. Now let's take a look at one other thing. When we came over here, we got a warning message. I'm going to pull up my warning log again, and what we see is that Rev M8 shape name changed to RE one by one. Let's take a look at that. This is Rev M8. Well, that was a six by six tube, and Rita 3D certainly supports things like tubes. The K joists are out, but tubes are not a problem. So where's our problem coming in as a result of this? Well, let's come back over in here. On the Risa 3D side, we would call this an HSS 6x6x8. By by and on the Revit side, we can see that this is called an HSS 6x6x0.5. By by what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over into my C drive, and I'm going to go into my Risa folder here. And from within the Risa folder, I have a Risa Revit Link 2011 subfolder. And in there, I have this Excel file called the Risa Revit mapping file. And let me just double click on that. This mapping file is fully editable by you, but it comes standard with a number of different shape sizes and names. And if I scroll through here, one thing I find is that when I look for what the Risa shape name is, 6x6x8, that translates to a Revit shape name of HSS 6x6x1 half. So can anybody here recognize what the problem is? The problem is that we have a fraction shown here on the Revit name, whereas when I come over into Revit, here's a decimal. And we're just doing a straight-up text comparison. The program is looking on the Revit side for an HSS 6x6x1 by by slash 2, and it doesn't find it. So obviously, we're going to have an issue with this. Now, I've seen this issue crop up a number of times, and the simple fact is some Revit installs install using the decimal numbers, some install using the fraction numbers. I'm not exactly sure why it happens in some cases versus others, but for those of you who do have the decimal numbers on the Revit side, if you don't want to change your Revit model, you can always come in and edit this Reza Revit mapping file in Excel, and you can actually use a number of smart Excel features to convert these fractions right over into decimals for you. In this case, though, for this model, what we're going to do is we're going to change the Revit name. So I'm going to come over in here in Revit, and I'm going to edit type on that brace. And I'm going to rename that brace. Instead of being 6 by 6 by 0 .500, it will be 6 by 6 by 1 slash 2. So now when I hit OK and I export this back out to Risa 3D again, what we're going to find is that it comes over without that warning message. And now when I look at it, it is correctly modeled as an HSS 6 by 6 by 8. So that's just another one of these aspects of shape names that becomes very important. And here our brace is correctly modeled in. Now let's say that we wanted to do this as an X brace. Well, I'm going to come back over into Revit now. And I'm going to set my work plane once again to grid line 1. And we're going to take a look at that north elevation on here. And I'm going to draw in another brace. And I'm going to split this brace here. So I'm going to snap midpoint, that's SM, to draw the brace to here. And then I'll draw another one up to the exact work point where we want it up here. OK, so physically now, this has been modeled correctly. Everything is at the correct angle. These two braces are parallel to each other. We're all set. But let's take a look at the analytical model. Now, in the analytical model, what we end up with is what amounts to be a kink within the model here. From this point to this point, the analytical line is following this brace, whereas from this point up to here, the analytical line is jumping upwards. And if I click on the braces, you'll see that the actual intersection of these two braces, that blue dot right there, does not coincide with the analytical line coming across here. And that's actually due to that kink. Now, when we export that over into Risa 3D, what we're going to find is that because the program is following the analytical lines and not the physical lines, we get our intersection occurring over here, whereas this brace is over here. And that's not going to work at all for our analysis. Now, taking a look over on the Revit side again, the biggest issue that we're running into is that in reality, this brace should have an analytical line that starts here and goes to halfway up this analytical line. 
And this brace, while existing physically down here, should be completely disconnected from its analytical line at both its start and end. However, Revit gives us no option for disconnecting a brace from its analytical line. It's impossible to do on their end. So what we will do instead is I will delete the two individual braces, and I'm going to come back in here, and I'm going to model a single brace going all the way from top to bottom. So now that I have these two braces, we no longer have the kink situation occurring. They're in there correctly. And when I come over here and I export, I'm going to export out to Risa 3D again. And we'll see that the braces are now coming through correctly. Now, one of the issues that you'll run into is your drawings, certainly from the Revit side. And some folks will say, well, these braces are supposed to be drawn as individual pieces on the Revit side. But now here, what we have is we have two braces that are coming over and intersecting with each other. Well, this is one of these situations where the drafting lines in Revit actually come in handy. What I can do is I can create a detail of this intersection, if I like, or I could actually model a gusset plate here. But using the masking regions and the detailing, or in other words, sort of the CAD drafting on the Revit side, I can sketch over these four braces as though they were actually four individual pieces coming together at a gusset plate. It's up to me. But if I want to get correct transfer over to the Risa side, I need to do it in this regard. Okay, so now we've got the braces all set up correctly. Let's go ahead and add a couple of boundary conditions on the Risa side. And I'm just going to put some bin boundary conditions in here and make sure that everything runs correctly now. And this is where we would notice the biggest errors would be by running it here. So I'm going to create a basic load case. And you'll see that when we transfer from Revit, because Revit has a few predefined load cases, they automatically get set up on the Risa side. But I can overwrite these. So here I'll set up a basic load case called self-weight. Accidentally tabbed my way out of there with a category of dead load and a Y gravity of minus one. So this is just going to solve this model for self-weight. And coming in, I'll create a load combination called self-weight only. Basic load case dead load with a factor of one. And when I solve it, it solves with no issues. So therefore, because we haven't gotten any warnings, we can probably say this model has been basically troubleshooted correctly so that we are getting a good transfer back and forth to Revit. And one of the nice things about making all these connect changes and corrections on the Revit side is that these problems will not propagate themselves into other Risa models that I might create out of this Revit model. I've truly cleaned up my Revit model. Now, we've worked on everything to get everything to come over correctly from the Risa 3D transfer. Let's take a look at the Risa floor transfer next because certainly the Risa floor transfer is going to get a little bit pickier about things than the Risa 3D transfer was. So I'm going to come up and take this exact same model that we've now fixed, and we're going to transfer it over to Risa floor. And I'm going to create a new exchange file just for this transfer. And so once again, we're just going to sort of go with all the default settings and hit OK. And the program should automatically launch Risa floor for me. But before it does that, it actually gives me a series of error messages that I can look over. This is one of those sophisticated aspects of the transfer between 3D or between Risa Floor and Revit, is that uh, we get some additional error messages that can be reported to us right here in this sort of drop-down uh, explanatory way. I'm going to hit OK here, and let's just take a look and see what we have for our Risa Floor model. So that's launching up right now. I'm going to come back into Revit. We'll read the floor launches and take a look at one of my elevations. And remember, when we took a look at this earlier, the elevations are set up at the ground floor at 100 feet and the roof at 111 feet. And setting the ground floor at 100 feet, while it's sort of an old architectural practice, is actually quite useful for transferring back and forth because Risa, Risa floor anyhow, does not recognize floors that are below elevation zero. You can't have a negative floor elevation. And when I come over to Risa floor and take a look at my full model, look at this. All we've got is just that joist and a couple of beams and one column. We have virtually nothing that came over. And one of the problems that we'll find on the Risa floor side, when I come to the floor spreadsheet, is that the floor elevation for the roof is listed as 11 feet. 
Now, coming back over into Revit, that was set at 111 feet. How did this happen? Well, if I click on this elevation on the actual level bubble within Revit, and I go over to Edit Type, one thing I can find out is that the levels that were set up in Revit to be shared coordinate systems. And if I flip that back to Project System for a moment, what I'll see is that I actually have an 11-foot project coordinate for the roof as opposed to 111 shared coordinate. And furthermore, I have a number of pieces that are sticking down below that zero elevation, and that's not going to work. Now I can flip back to shared, and we have the numbers where we want them correct. So what we actually want to do is when I export over to Risa, instead of exporting using the project coordinate system, I want to export using the shared coordinate system. And so now when I hit OK, it should transfer over correctly. We still get some warning messages on there. But what I'll find is that if I come into floors now, we correctly have the elevation set at 111 feet. And you also see that because the grid by default in Risa floor shows at zero feet, so the model appears to be sort of hovering up in the air. But that's exactly where we want it in this case. Okay, so we've exported using shared coordinates. However, this column didn't come over. Now, why didn't that column come over? What we'd find is that the message that we got about the column, let me just export this again so we can take a look at it real quick, is that we get no match found for top level parameter for actually a number of different columns. And what is the top level parameter? Well, Risa Floor cares about sort of a floor by floor analysis. And if I take a look at this column, when I click on it, what we have is a base level and a top level. And these are what's called the column reference levels. Now you'll note that on this column, the base of it is defined as being two feet below the ground. And the top of the column is defined as being 11 feet above the ground. What this means though, is that this column is defined about only one level, as opposed from going to floor to floor. And Risa Floor only cares about columns that are going from floor to floor, not little stub columns, which it's sort of imagining this to be. So what we need to do is correctly set the top level to be roof with an offset of zero rather than ground with an offset of 11 feet. And when I hit apply, you'll see that physically that column doesn't change at all. But now when I export that over to Risa Floor, we're going to see that the column does come over correctly now. And so now here's that column shown in plan view. And coming to take a look at a full model view, the column has come through all right. Okay, the next thing that we're going to want to take a look at in here is the columns that are down at the base. Now you look at these and say, well, that's not a column, that's a pedestal. Well, actually, those are columns. And we were getting a warning about them as well when we exported about the top and bottom parameters. The problem is that a footing, as defined in Revit, does not inherently have a pedestal on it. So oftentimes what people will do is they will model a concrete column that is very short to sit on top of that footing. The problem is that Risa Floor gets very confused by this, as well it should, but in Risa Floor we don't want to have these little concrete pedestals in there because we're not trying to do a foundation design in Risa Floor. So what I can do is I can come over to these little concrete columns, and you see there's this Analyze As setting. We can choose that the column is a hanger, gravity, lateral, or not for analysis. And in this case, I'm going to flip those both to be not for analysis. And that's going to prevent them from having analytical models. And as a result, the link is going to ignore them as I go back and forth. So now when I export, it should come over correctly without any issues relating to those little stub columns on the bottom here. You can see, indeed, they're not showing up over on this side. So we're fine with that. Now, this beam that's across the front here is also not transferring. Let's take a look at that one. If I come back over into my Revit model, and I just click on this beam here, we can see that this beam on the outside, say, has a reference level of roof, whereas the beam right here has a reference level of ground, and it has a start and end offset of 11 feet. So therefore, this beam is part of the ground, but it's 11 feet above, and that's not correct at all. We actually want to say that beam is part of the roof. And you see the program automatically corrects the start and end level offset as we flip the reference level to be a roof. So now with the correct roof reference level, Risa Floor should see it as being part of the roof and not as part of the foundation. 
because if it's assigned as ground, it's assumed to be part of the foundation, regardless of what its vertical offset actually is. So now let's transfer back over into Risa Floor. And I can take a look at the model now, and we can see that we're making a lot of progress on this. So that beam is up there. Now the next thing we want to take a look at is the wall. We can see that wall has not transferred over, so I'm going to come back into Revit and I'm going to click on the wall. Let's take a look at it. Okay, so its base constraint is ground, that's great, and its top constraint is set as unconnected. And we have an unconnected height. The purpose of having things as unconnected on the Revit side is that when something is unconnected, that's a cantilever wall. And in this case, we certainly don't have a cantilever wall, and Risa Floor doesn't design cantilever walls. It's going to design ordinary walls for buildings, such as bearing and shear walls. So what I need to do is tell this wall, rather than being unconnected, just sticking up 11 feet into the air, that it actually goes up to the level of roof. Now, I can give it a, a top offset if I like, but I'll just leave that as flush with the roof right now. And so now, physically, once again, nothing at all has changed with this wall, but now Risa Floor is going to recognize it because it's no longer an unconnected wall. It's actually extending all the way up. And so if I come over here and Risa Floor... Here we go. Now we've got all that set up on there. All right, so this is great, but we're still getting a warning, and I sort of skipped past it when we went over here. We're getting a warning about this beam down here, the grade beam. Reason Floor is saying that it has an issue with the fact that there's a beam that's assigned to reference level ground, which is not being created as a floor in Risa Floor. And that reference level ground is what's causing the issue, but at the same time, Risa Floor should not be caring about this beam. However, in Risa 3D, when we go to do an analytical design of this, we certainly want the flexural stiffness of this grade beam to come into play when we're analyzing this frame overall. One option we have is to change the structural usage of that grade beam. Now, you'll see there's all these different options, girder, joist, other, purlin, and in general, Risa doesn't care which one of these you use. But one of them that does have an effect is the horizontal bracing setting. Any member that I set as horizontal bracing and I export over to Risa Floor will not show up in Risa Floor. However, in the Risa 3D model embedded in Risa Floor, it will appear since it's assumed to be a lateral only element with no gravity, uh, basically gravity resistance in the design of the model. So now let's export this over with that grade beam set to be as a horizontal brace or an H brace. And we can see we get no warnings about the beams. We're getting some slab warnings, but I'm going to skip over that for now. Those are just the slabs that are down here at the base, and it's sort of an irrelevant warning. And so now when I come over and read the floor, we don't get any warnings about this. There's no problems with that at all. All right, but we want to make sure that that actually came through. We want to be able to see that beam on the Risa 3D side, and we're not going to be able to see anything right now because everything is set to be gravity members. If I sort of drag this data entry toolbar out of the way in Risa floor, we see we have the lateral and gravity, and everything in blue is gravity. Well, we can change that on the Revit side. Certainly, this joist is going to be gravity, and if I scroll down on the left here, you'll see that we have that analyze as. We saw the not for analysis earlier. We can also choose between gravity and lateral. So if I select these three beams here, and I scroll down on the left there, I can say instead of gravity, these are lateral beams. Similarly, I can come down to my grade beam, and I can tell it that it is a lateral beam. I'm going to tell both of the columns that they are lateral columns. And I'm going to come over to the wall now, and you'll see there's slightly different options for the wall. What we have is structural usage on a wall, and I can choose bearing, shear, or structural combined. And whether I set this as shear or structural combined, both of those basically just mean lateral for how the link looks at them. So I'm going to say this is a shear wall. Now when I export out to Risa Floor, overwriting my previous model, we should get the lateral model coming through. Oh, I have to hit OK on the warning log. Now it relaunches it, and here we go. That joist is gravity. Everything else in the model is now set to lateral. And with it being lateral, I should be able to solve the model and go over into Risa 3D to take a look at that beam. But I solve, and I get a framing problem. 
Now, this framing problem is something that you'll probably run into a lot when you first start going back and forth between Revit and Risa floor. And we get this warning here that that beam is unsupported. Well, that's odd because when we exported out into Risa 3D, we didn't get any sort of unsupported framing problems. However, one thing that we didn't really account for was the fact that this is a cantilever beam. Now, in Risa 3D, I can, because of physical members, I can draw a beam of any length and connect anything to it, and I have no issues. And Risa Floor understands physical members, but Risa Floor also needs to specifically know whether something is a cantilever or not. And in this case, if I click on this beam and I turn on the node display within Risa Floor, what you'll see is that this is a single beam spanning from here to here over that column. And this sort of framing is not allowed on the Risa Floor side. I need to come back to Revit, and I need to actually model this as a true cantilever as opposed to just a physical beam that extends to that point. So what I can do is I can come over here in Revit and select that beam in plan view. And I'm going to pull that beam right back to the column. And with that beam being connected to the column, now I'm going to come in and I'm going to draw another beam. And I'm going to draw this beam as a W16 by 26. And I'm going to draw it from that column out, say, 6 feet. That's fine. So now I have two separate beams drawn. And if I click on this W16 by 26, you'll see that there's a start connection option for it. And right now that's set to none. But if I say cantilever moment, you'll see it sticks a little open can or moment uh, connection symbol right down on there. So now this is done as two beams. When I export over to Risa Floor, Risa Floor recognizes that when two beams are in line with each other and one of them has a cantilever moment, that that is actually a cantilever. And so this is modeled correctly now as one beam on the Risa Floor side, even though we did it as two beams on the Revit side. And this will allow us to solve. So now that I solve, I get a warning that there was no slab edge, there was no load attribution, and I get some composite warnings, and definitely that's the case because all steel beams are assumed to be composite when brought over uh, from Risa Floor into Revit. Next, when I transfer over into Risa 3D, I'll be able to see that that gray beam did actually come through right here. So now we're all set with regards to that. So at this point, the model is adequately cleaned up, and I could bring it back over to Revit at this point, but I think we've really covered all of the major modeling issues that you're going to run into when you go back and forth between the uh, Revit link and Risa floor. Now, of course, if you have any you know, further questions or issues, that's why we have the other resources available to you, uh, such as the Risa Revit link help file, the Risa Revit link user's manual, and then, of course, you can contact myself or any of my colleagues here at support at risatech.com with your Revit issues, and we'll be glad to give you assistance. And I'd also just like to mention that the issues that we've looked at today are sort of universal for the Risa Revit link. So even if you're not using Revit Structure 2011, even if you're still on 2010, these issues still do apply.